Welcome to Kaplan's Program Director Insights, Becoming a Top Residency Applicant. My name is Dr. Christopher Semino. I am the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Kaplan Test Prep Medical. My guest today is Dr. Shanti Harkasun. She's the Program Director for Family Mes Medicine Residency at Phelps Hospital in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. So uh, you're the other side of the equation for a lot of these applicants. Uh, they're, the, they're the people who are trying to get into your program and you're the person who's deciding who gets interviews, who gets in, who doesn't. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your, the experience from your perspective. Um, September 15th arrives, ARIS releases its applications. What do you do? Well, we're very excited to see who has decided to apply to our program. And so we start downloading, downloading the applications immediately and start reviewing them to see who they are and uh, what's going to happen next. So at the stroke of midnight or 9 in the morning? or um, As soon as business o yep. opens. Normal business yeah, day. But, exactly. But they're all there. And uh, talk to me about the process. You must get hundreds to thousands of applications. Yes. Uh, way too many to look at individually. How do you yes. filter through all of that? So usually we start by looking the, at the most recent uh, graduates um, and then we have a few criteria that we filter by so we like to look at our applicants who have passed their exams on the first attempt mm -hmm. um, and then we start going through them. We divvy them up by alphabet and then all the faculty take a little piece of the pie mm -hmm. and then we start looking through the applications one at a time. Mm -hmm. do you, mm -hmm. Is there a magic score? cut off? No, actually in our program we, we just take make sure everybody's passed the exams. Um, but in some programs they do have a certain set score that they go by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say in some programs you mean in other residency programs yes. that there's, there's uh, things like ENT, dermatology, they probably Absolutely. have a cut off. Yes. Right. Um, and at the end of the process, when, when do you stop looking at applications? In other words, after September 30th, are you done? Have you found everyone you need? You know, it's very hard to stop looking because you never know if another great applicant is going to submit mm -hmm. their application. But unfortunately, we only have so many interview slots. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to stop looking once we've filled all of our interview positions. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. um, how many spots, residency spots, do you have? We only have six. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to expand to eight, so we mm -hmm. may have eight. OK. I mm -hmm. uh, wish you luck with that. Thank you. Um, and for those six spots, how many interview spots do you use? We generally interview about 100 people. We do something a little bit differently. We offer Skype interviews first. Mm -hmm. And so we offer about 100 of those. And then if, an, if people pass that first interview, then they come in for a live interview. And we average about 70 to 75 live interviews. Mm -hmm. And what's your interviewing season like? When do you start? When do you end? We start in a, around mid-October, and we tend to run through December. We sometimes squeeze in another interview in January, but we like to finish it up before the holiday season mm -hmm. starts. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I know some programs, they'll have a set number of interviews, and the first week in, that they have applications, they send out, let's say they have 100 spots, mm -hmm. they send out 200 invites, and the first 100 people, they fill all their interview spots, and then they're done with filling interview spots. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that, how does that compare with your approach? Um, we, we do fill them as we get the right candidate. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, we do have the Skype, Skype process, so that mm -hmm. helps us out a little bit. Mm -hmm. where we can spread it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, we only have so many people to, to do the work. And so as we start going through the applications, we fill those spots. And then, and then there's no more. Mm -hmm. And it's as it's sad for us too when yeah. we can't look at any more great applicants. We know there are a lot of wonderful candidates. Mm -hmm. What about the issue of uh, sort of the overbooking, uh, over inviting that some programs have done? Uh, what's your thinking about that? Um, you know, everybody has their way of doing things, and yeah. certainly some programs may have some cancellations, and mm -hmm. so that can help having people lined up for those cancellations. Mm -hmm. um, we don't practice that way. Mm -hmm. We really offer the spots that we have so that we're not giving anybody mixed messages. Yeah. And single out uh, uh, the, the piece of the application that was the most important for getting an interview. What would mm -hmm. it be? For getting selected for an interview, it, it is the academic record. So mm -hmm. taking your step one and step two, passing it on the first attempt, and then also having a great um, uh, uh, 
what do you call it, a transcript from medical school that yeah. helps. Uh, talk to me about international medical graduates, mm -hmm. both U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. How does your program look at them? For international graduates, the most important thing is the level of experience they have in the United States because um, it's very difficult. Residency is difficult to begin with, so have to, to have to come into residency and then to train in the, in the U.S. system is a burden that's great for the, not just the program but also for the applicant. Mm -hmm. So that is a, is a big factor for our international gradu um, graduate applicants. Um, so that being said, um, it's generally the international graduates who are U.S. citizens who have gone to school in the Caribbean, for example, tend to have a leg up on our, on our international graduates from, from other countries, mm -hmm. um, just pu purely for that reason. And um, what is your thoughts about observerships as opposed to clerkships? I think that any experience is great experience. However, observerships uh, usually imply that there are no, there's no hands-on experience, mm -hmm. and that's really important when it comes to showing a, a program director that um, you, you've learned something or acquired some new talent. So you said step one. Uh, I'm sorry. You said exam first path. Yes. You said first attempt passage was an important first criteria in that first week. Um, do you look at applicants who have had multiple attempts? Only if we need to. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's getting more and more competitive every year. So mm -hmm. uh, in the last year, we didn't, we didn't have a chance to go to that level mm -hmm. because we had plenty of applicants mm -hmm. in that first year. Mm -hmm. Tell me about step three. Step three is a great thing to have on the application if it's been passed. Mm -hmm. Having not passed step three doesn't add anything to the application mm -hmm. and it may even subtract from it. Mm -hmm. um, and what if someone's missing a score? Uh, they haven't taken step one CK, step one or step two CS and so forth. Right. So my advice to students is usually to go ahead and apply because to not be in the in the pool when, when people are starting to review applications can be a, a real handicap. However, when, when you're in a really competitive pool like that, it's best to have everything in right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And of all the step exam, which, which one is the most important to you? Um, step one and two are equally yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about someone who's applying to multiple specialties, not just family medicine, but mm -hmm. other more competitive specialties? Right. So um, we actually try to decipher that from the application because mm -hmm. honestly any program would prefer to have applicants who want to do the specialty that that, that program is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, we understand that applicants need to widen their options and make sure that they get a spot, um, but by far we prefer that our applicants love family medicine and want to do family medicine. Mm -hmm. makes it a lot easier to, to be a resident when you do what you love. What are some of the clues that you look for in the application for that? We look for applicants who have had a family medicine experience um, mm -hmm. so they can speak to that and they, we know that they've been in that situation and we know that they'll love it. We look for references from a family physician. Um, we look for comments from their family medicine rotation, things like that. Mm -hmm. How about research? How does that play out in the application? Research um, doesn't weigh heavily in the application. Certainly having a broad experience and having exposure to research is terrific. Um, but hands-on clinical experience and doing well in other things, volunteering in a clinical setting are much more valuable compared mm -hmm. to research. And I guess the same goes for publications as well. Same, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the personal statement. Mm -hmm. um, can you, uh, without, without c breaching any confidentiality, what's the strangest personal statement you remember reading? <laughs> Some of the stranger ones are when people just love, t they share their very, very personal details in, in quite uh, a, a deep level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, that can be a little bit alarming sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, th that's usually it. Otherwise, personal statements are really a reflection of who the person is. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know. So a personal statement that's too personal is not helpful, is what you're saying. Well, you know, you don't want to divulge too much of your personal uh -huh. struggles and and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you haven't even met anybody. Have you? Do you remember reading any personal statements where, um, let's say, someone had a, an obvious failure? They failed step one or something uh -huh. like that. 
Um, and they spoke to that in their personal statement and it came across in a positive way. Absolutely, I highly recommend that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that taking responsibility for things that haven't gone well in your personal statement or in your application in general can really help the, the person who's just reviewing the paperwork mm -hmm. get a really good impression of who you are and why that might have happened. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, if you had to describe the perfect personal statement, what would it be like? It's, it's, some, it's a statement that reflects the individual. I think when a person speaks from who they are and what they care about, um, then it will come out just right. And mm -hmm. it, you know, there's not a particular topic that's best. It's just whatever's right for that person, what has them emulate who they are and how they feel about their specialty of choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's always nice to speak to the specialty and how it connects to, to who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it always turns out just right. Mm -hmm. Definitely shorter is better than long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about letters of recommendation? How do they play in the application process? You know, I wish I could rely on the letters as much as I'd like to. I do read them all, and we have every interviewer read all of the letters of recommendation, so they are very important. Um, frequently what we see is that the letters can be sort of standardized, so we are not sure if this person has just written several letters that just sound the same for many people. We like the letters when they're when they have some detail about that particular that person's particular interaction with the applicant. That helps tremendously, mm -hmm. and if they speak to how the applicant will perform in residency. Mm -hmm. well, what would you do? Let's say you have a letter that does speak personally to that mm -hmm. particular applicant, but it uses the wrong name. It, it you know it's clearly been, or it uses the wrong pronouns or something. Yeah. Like that. So clearly they've edited a previous letter, mm -hmm. and yet they've also talking about that applicant. Yes. How do you deal with that? We usually will oversee things like that. Mm -hmm. I write a lot of letters and I, you know, I, I will rewrite a letter as well. Mm -hmm. But it's just the attention to detail. Yeah. Sometimes physicians are very busy when they're writing letters, so we have a lot of understanding mm -hmm. for those kind of oversights. Yeah. Whereas with a generic letter, I imagine, then there's no way to know did, did, is it an oversight or is it a completely wrong letter, so it's, then it's not useful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, what about the, the status of a physician writing the letter? They're whether Let's start with whether they're a U.S. citizen physician mm -hmm. or a non-U.S. citizen physician. How does that play out? Sure. I, I think it's more a matter of whether the physician practices in the United States and whether mm -hmm. that interaction occurred in a U.S. medical system mm -hmm. because that allows us to know that that person actually saw this person engage in a U.S. system. Mm -hmm. That's more important than whether or not uh, what their ethnicity or citizenship is for mm -hmm. that particular physician. Um, letters from, um, for example, if a student has done a medical school in another country and the physicians in the medical school write the letter, they don't quite help us know how well this applicant will thrive in our setting. Mm -hmm. And what about the rank of the physician? So uh, what if you get a letter from a resident mm -hmm. uh, or a fellow? How would those compare? You know, that would be, that's interesting. I've never received a letter oh, from a resident. Okay. I think that would be very uh, interesting to, to get. I think I would trust that opinion. Not to say that everybody should go out and get resident letters, um, but uh, the title doesn't so much, uh, that doesn't carry as much weight as the content and the nature of the interaction of the two individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, what would be, if, if you were giving advice to people who are seeking letters of a recommendation, mm -hmm. uh, what would be some cautions you would tell them? I would definitely caution um, against using friends and friends of parents and things like that. I think uh, people can pick up on those types of letters, mm -hmm. um, especially when that person says, I've known this person for all their life, and but they can't speak to any clinical interaction. Mm -hmm. That can be a, a red flag. Yeah. And then that letter just won't carry as much weight in general. Mm -hmm. um, I would also caution against uh, obtaining letters from nobody in the, in, your, in the specialty that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. That is definitely a red flag. Um, getting letters from people who are chairs and vice presidents and things um, just because of their title doesn't also help tremendously. It's really about their personal interaction mm -hmm. with the applicant. Sometimes um, it may also not be in the best interest to, to look at um, 
the applicant's cultural background and getting letters from everybody from the same cultural background, then you can't distinguish whether that those are just friends and family friends or if your parents a physician, they might be one of their friends, you know. Mm -hmm. Things like that can get a little bit difficult to interpret and may hurt. Mm -hmm. So you said that the, uh, a letter that really speaks to their clinical experience is very useful. Yes. Um, what else would you look for in a strong letter? The time that the person has known the applicant, the, the level of interaction between the two. For example, if I'm the course supervisor but I never spent any time doing rounds or, or being in the clinic with the applicant, I'm going to have a hard time speaking to how they are with the patients. Mm -hmm. Um, also, sometimes um, the, the letter writer can speak to how patients reacted to the applicant. That can be very useful yeah. as well. Um, if the person writing the letter has known the applicant in the greater system, so how they engage with staff and with residents, that can be great. Certainly when the writer is someone who is in a residency program, that, that's very valuable because then we know they've had experience reading letters and writing letters and seeing students, and that helps a lot. Is there such a thing as a letter that's too old? Yes, yeah. absolutely. We look for letters that are written in the last year. And even if that person hasn't worked with that applicant, that they have reconnected and written a new letter. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it only speaks to experiences that were held back then, mm -hmm. and we don't know what's happened in, re in more recent time. Mm -hmm. Suppose you had an applicant, and you have they've submitted a series of letters uh, and there's one family medicine letter and two orthopedics letters. What would you make of that? <laughs> um, I, I'll make the best of it. Um, it's really important that I do have the family medicine letter. And sometimes somebody has a great experience in orthopedics and you have connections there. And so I'll take that with a grain of salt. Let's talk about uh, the interviews now. So you've sent out your invites. Um, you've gotten people who have uh, agreed to come. And you, you said you do Skype interviews. Do you do also in-person interviews? Absolutely. So let's talk about the Skype interviews first. Sure. Um, for a single applicant, how many Skype interviews would they do? Just one. Just one. Mm -hmm. And does that help decide whether they move on to an in-person interview? Absolutely. And what is the interviewer looking for in the Skype interview? Well, by that time, we've already reviewed the application, so we, we have a sense of their academic performance. And so, although we focus a little bit on, on the academic skills of the applicant, we spend most of the time looking at the interpersonal interactions and the person's knowledge of our program and their engagement with us as we interview them on Skype. The whole interview lasts uh, 20 minutes. How do you judge their knowledge of your program? Well, based on the questions that they ask. Are they informed questions or are they gener generic questions that they may ask of any program? Mm -hmm. um, and so now you've uh, screened out the people who just applied and didn't look up your program. Yeah. Um, and they have some ability to communicate mm -hmm. and you've invited them for the in-person mm -hmm. interview. Um, when does the interview process really start? You mean with the person yeah. or in? For in the person, from the person's point of view. Well, interview the, the interview process has begun as soon as we do the Skype process. Mm -hmm. So now, any communication that happens between the applicant and the program is part of the interview process. I always caution my applicants and my advisees that it's really important how you treat the residency coordinator, anybody who is with the program or the hospital. If it's not a good interaction, we usually don't rank the applicant. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the process proceeds with coming in for that live interview, meeting with three different people. Usually it's two faculty and a resident. Mm -hmm. They get a tour of the hospital, tour of the clinic, um, and then we wrap it up. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to expand on that a little more. So they get a tour. Yes. Uh, who's giving the tour and does that person feed back information to the process? Absolutely everybody is engaged in the interview process. We give a lot of thought to how we structure our day and um, anybody that gives us feedback is very, very important for us because we want this person to thrive in our setting. And so we want them to be able to feel comfortable and to engage positively with our staff, with our residents, with our faculty. And so if anybody has an alarming uh, encounter, and gives us that feedback, we will usually not rank that applicant. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that when the applicant asks good questions about your program, informed questions, yes. uh, that that's good. What are other things that you would consider good questions? 
I think it's always good to ask about um, the financial security of the institution um, and the, the future vision of the program director for the program so that you know that the program's heading in the right direction and in a direction that's aligned with the applicant's future. It's always great to, to, to have a conversation about the relationship between residents themselves and residents and faculty. What about bad questions? <laughs> the, the bad questions are the canned questions, you mm -hmm. know, um, things that are already on my website. When people ask me things that are very clear on the website, I get a little bit disappointed mm -hmm. and I and, uh, may not be so in intrigued by the applicant. Mm -hmm. What about a, a, an applicant who asks about salary and vacation time? What's <laughs> your reaction to that? Um, it's usually not a question that's appropriate for a program director. That information is to be found on the website. Um, and most of our applicants save that, those questions for our residents. Mm -hmm. And usually it's one-on-one -on -one with a resident. Um, there are also several opportunities to engage with residents after the interview. And so some of those questions may be better asked later in a different mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about what the applicant asks. What do you ask the applicant? <laughs> we've actually developed behavioral interview questions, which I unfortunately can't share with you because then I would have to create a whole new <laughs> right. set of questions. Um, but we, we, we ask very simple questions. They're not meant to trick an applicant. They're really meant to see and get a feel for different aspects of the individual and get a sense of if they're the right fit for the program. Mm -hmm. Can I, I know you don't want to share with me the <laughs> questions for obvious reasons, but let me see if I can propose some potential behavioral sure, questions to sure. see if that gets a flavor for what you're talking about. Uh -huh. um, so would it be, you say to the applicant, suppose you found yourself in the following situation, yes. what would you do? Um, you're on your way to the lab to deliver some blood that you drew and you see a patient in the hall who looks confused. Yes. And, th and then you say, well, what, do you, what would you do? That's and, a perfect yeah. question. Maybe okay. I should Oh, you should that. steal it. Okay, yeah, that's I think that's fine. great. Um, <laughs> except you can't use that one because everyone's <laughs> now heard it. So. Um, but, but it's based, and it's not, as you said, it's not a trick question. No. Uh, it's not like there's a secret answer. Exactly. There might be many possible correct answers, and yes. you want to see how they deal with the situation. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so what tips would you give someone who's about to go to their first interview? Um, I would say be yourself. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, this is a place where you're going to spend three years. You're going to be very deeply interacted with every, interacting deeply with everybody. So it's very important to find a place that fits. Um, and then also it's uh, tremendously important to research the program, to look at the website, to see what kind of people go to this program, what, what is the program's mission, um, and also uh, to think about why, why, why am I choosing this specialty, right? So that you can speak to the things that you care about in, um, in, a, in a way that, that is relatable and a way that is clear to all the people that you'll be meeting that day. Um, it's also really great to practice a little bit um, to meet with some people who, who can role play with you or maybe even practice in the mirror and do a little practicing so that you feel more comfortable in the interview session because it's daunting no matter who you are, no matter where it is. Have you ever interviewed an applicant who seemed over-rehearsed? Hmm. No, n I don't think so. I've met a lot of applicants who are very nervous, um, who are a little shell-shocked. Um, but not over rehearsed. I think, I think if the rehearsal is just being natural and answering questions, then I don't think you could ever be over rehearsed. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you can memorize answers to questions, and that can that can be a, a put off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, have you ever gotten the sense that you're interviewing someone who's interviewed at 25 other programs already? <laughs> this is their last interview. I believe that we get applicants who've interviewed at that many programs sometimes. Um, and the only time that we have a sense of that is when the person's not engaged with us. Mm -hmm. When, you know, they come late, uh, they want to leave early, um, they're not as engaged when they're having lunch with the residents, things like that will, will be an alarming thing for us. The info that you get from the interview, how does that feed into your ranking of candidates? It's the most important aspect in terms of our ranking process. 
Uh, we do use a numeric system where we assign values to different things, such as our questions, um, and then we rank order the p everybody based on the numerical total that they achieve. Uh, but then, based on the interview, we may go ahead and tweak the list just a little bit uh, because our in personal interactions are really the most valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to clarify, are you saying that uh, all the stuff in the application, once someone's come to the interview, that that other stuff is let almost unimportant for the rank list? Yes, actually, because by that time, by the time people have interviewed, we've already vetted their academic standing. Mm -hmm. And so usually everybody who's come for an interview is academically um, capable of being a great resident. We do a little bit more probing into that area, but primarily the rest is interpersonal. And so yes, once they've made it to the interview, everything else is not so important. Any other final comments about the interviews? I think it's an exciting time. It's uh, very inspiring for programs and the program director to be in this process. We are just as nervous as the applicants, maybe not a, as much because we get to do it every year, but um, we are also trying to be on our best behavior, so it's, it's really kind of like a dating game. And so hopefully that would help our applicants be a little bit less nervous as they start the process. Is there anything I forgot to ask you? <laughs> I don't think so. You've been very thorough. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you for joining us for Program Director Insights, becoming a top residency applicant. I hope you learned something and you'll join us again in the future.